Hello and welcome to this video on relative intensity noise. In this video, I'm going to explain how you can go about quantifying the degree of noisiness that the power of a laser exhibits. So let's imagine that we've measured this trace of power over time using the setup up here in the top right corner. So we're assuming that a laser diode is shining light directly onto an ideal measurement system. And when I say the measurement system is ideal, it simply means that it integrates or measures for a very long time and also that it has a very high frequency response. In other words, no matter how quickly the power of the laser varies, we're always able to capture those variations accurately. And this is just a simplifying assumption for now to make sure that any fluctuations we're seeing here are only due to the properties of the laser and not some artifact of the measurement system. So anyway, first thing we can notice here is that this measurement has a certain average power over its duration. So we can begin by simply subtracting that power away from the original measurement, which gives us a new trace. And it simply tells us the deviation away from the average power at some given instant. For example, maybe it's one microwatt in this case here. So it's a good start, but it still doesn't really tell us if one microwatt is a lot of fluctuation. So of course, that's going to depend on how much average power is present in the first place. Because if you only have 10 microwatts of power, then one microwatt of deviation is quite a lot. It's like 10%. But if the average power is 10 watts, then the answer is clearly no, it's quite a small amount. So to get a new trace, we can simply divide through by the average power, which gives us a new graph here that tells us the fractional deviation away from the average power. And um, that's all kind of a bit more normalized and a bit more um, easy to compare with other lasers perhaps, but it's still kind of inconvenient because this particular measurement here, in some sense, it's just a historical record of how much the power deviated at some point in the past. But it's also not very useful for telling us exactly how it's going to change in the future. So it'd be nice if we can take this entire measurement and just boil it down to a single number that indicates how noisy the laser is. And to do this, we can just compute the RMS variation in the power. So we simply take this trace, square it, and integrate it over the entire duration. And then, of course, divide by the duration of the measurement to get the average squared variation. Then we can compute the square root and uh, potentially multiply by the average power to get the RMS variation. Now, this should be fairly familiar to anyone who's done a bit of uh, signal processing. And of course, you can decide if you want to report, for example, the, um, let's say the relative RMS value here, where maybe that's a bit more interesting if you go to compare two different lasers that operate at two different power levels to sort of see which one is more noisy inherently. But um, if you're dealing with, let's say, you want to deploy a particular laser in a particular context where its power fluctuations can't exceed a certain limit, then maybe stating the actual RMS power measured in watts or whatever would be a bit more informative. But again, that's, that kind of depends on your particular situation. So this is a very good start for quantifying the degree of noisiness that a laser exhibits, but it's still a little bit incomplete because it's possible for two different lasers to have the same RMS variation in the power, but for that variation to happen at two very different frequencies. For example, here we can see that the laser indicated by the blue trace and one by the red trace here have about the same sort of deviation away from the average, but clearly the blue one is oscillating much more slowly than the red one. And just to be clear, this is not because they have two different carrier frequencies. We can assume that these two have the same carrier frequency, but they just have different noise properties where the blue one oscillates more slowly. So the question is, in some way we can sort of quantify which, let's say, noise frequencies contribute the most to the variation in the output power. And you've probably already guessed that this is going to involve taking Fourier transforms. And before we get into that, I just want to highlight the difference between two-sided and one-sided spectra. Because if you um, have a purely real signal, which this kind of relative deviation trace always will be, and you take its Fourier transform, then you get a spectrum which is Hermitian. And in short, this just means that the spectral value you get over here for a positive frequency will be identical to the one you get for a negative frequency, except with a complex conjugation on top. And if you take the absolute square, you simply get the same value on both sides here. And so the point is that when you want to um, draw a spectrum of the different noise components, you don't really need to draw it two-sided with both the negative and positive frequencies because the negative ones will be identical to the positive ones anyway. So it's very um, normal to just uh, state a one-sided spectrum here that only has the positive frequencies and then just have it be twice as intense as it would be if you had a two-sided spectrum. Now this is just like a small detail, but it is relevant because usually when you read papers on noisiness of lasers in terms of both uh, amplitude noise but also phase noise, you'll see these one-sided traces here. So just remember that there is sort of a factor of two compared to just doing the full Fourier transform directly. So anyway, with that out of the way, um, the point is that we can take this uh, relative intensity trace we had from before in the time domain, compute its Fourier transform, then take the absolute square to get the so-called relative intensity noise spectrum, or RIN spectrum for short. Uh, 
And we see here that indeed this uh, blue trace that oscillates more slowly, it peaks at a lower frequency compared to the um, high frequency variation for the red trace, which peaks at a higher frequency. And uh, so it's kind of nice to, to see that we can use these spectra to see which noise components contribute the most, but we can actually take it a little bit further. Because if we think about the units of this trace here, we find that it's actually in units of one per hertz. And I always found this a little bit, I guess, uninformative because it's something dimensionless per hertz. But what exactly is that dimensionless thing? But if we look at this uh, expression up here for computing the RIN trace, it's um, actually possible to figure out that in some sense the units here are really a relative noise contribution squared per hertz. So it's basically a density plot that tells us how much do frequencies within a certain range contribute to the overall noise. And in fact, if we think about Plancherald's theorem, which is just a nice property of uh, Fourier transforms, then we can actually recover the RMS variation of the power that we got in the time domain by simply in uh, rather integrating these uh, wind curves in the frequency domain from zero to infinity, and of course computing the square root and multiplying by the average power. And this is just sort of a nice property of free transforms that they uh, conserve the integrated squared value of any function that you feed in. And of course, that's very useful in a lot of other signal processing applications and engineering and even quantum mechanics, of course. But anyway, um, a kind of nice insight about this is that it allows us to figure out how much noise we get in a situation where we're not using an ideal measurement setup, but using something a bit more realistic. So let's assume that we've somehow measured this RIN curve here using a very ideal uh, set up, for example, in some kind of very uh, fancy laboratory where um, we can integrate for a very long time to capture all these low frequencies and also um, have a very high frequency response from this very expensive, very fancy equipment. But now let's suppose that we want to deploy the same laser diode in a situation where the measurement system is not ideal. For example, maybe you've characterized the laser diode in some laboratory for uh, because you want to use it for telecommunications, but then you actually deploy it in a real component and then you don't have access to this um, specialized equipment, you have to use a less ideal photodiode, for example. So what happens then? Well, if the um, measurement setup is not ideal, it basically just means that we have a finite measurement time and also some maximum sensitive frequency because the electronics inside of the measurement system can't really respond to power variations that happen faster than some given time scale. So the point is that we essentially uh, cut off this RIN curve at two different points so that anything below the frequency limit specified by the measurement time will simply happen too slowly for us to even capture in the measurement and in some sense it just gets included automatically inside of the average. Whereas anything that happens more quickly than this maximum sensitive frequency will also be cut off because any power variation that it causes will simply be filtered out by the slow electronics of the measurement system. In some sense this is kind of similar to the way that it's possible for you to watch a video on a screen even though the screen is really flashing a series of discrete images onto itself very quickly. But because that flashing rate is much much higher than the so-called update rate, you can think about it like that, of your eye, it just looks like a smooth transition. You don't see those very bright, discrete changes. So anyway, the point is that if you want to compute the RMS variation you measure with this system here, you simply have to integrate the RIN curve from the lower frequency set by the finite measurement time up to the upper frequency set by the maximum sensitive frequency of the measurement system. And then of course you just take the square root and multiply by the average power to get the RMS variation in this case. And note that it's going to be smaller than the, uh, the full RMS variation here we get for the entire range. Now, um, another small detail here is that technically what you should be doing is defining some kind of response function for the measurement system and then multiply that onto the RIN curve and then integrate it from zero to infinity. But this previous approximation of just having sort of two hard cutoff limits here, um, it's usually a pretty good approximation that works in most cases. So this is just sort of a, um, I guess a practical overview of RIN curves and how they can be used. But I also want to spend a bit of time on where these RIN curves even come from for a typical laser diode. So in a previous video, I um, explained how to solve a set of a couple differential equations that describe how variations in the input current fed into a laser diode cause variations in the output photon number. And in short, I was able to show that there is some, um, I guess, fundamental variation in the current, even if it's you intend to keep it completely steady. There's always going to be a bit of fluctuation because you have a varying number of electrons coming into the, the diode. That basically gives rise to a baseline amount of noise given by the purple curve here. But then, additionally, you might have some technical noise from your power supplies not being perfectly, perfectly ideal systems. And that essentially just pushes this curve up here. And just to clarify, the way I got this red curve here was by simply solving these couple differential equations to get an expression for the number of photons over time. And then I can simply uh, subtract the average number, divide by the average number as well, and take the Fourier transform as I explained on the, the previous slides to get this uh, red curve here.
And uh, you'll notice that it has essentially three distinct noise regions, where for very low frequencies, we get essentially white noise. You can see this is perfectly flat right here, or at least mostly flat. And um, then we have a resonant regime here, because the laser diode is essentially a cavity with some kind of resonance that is determined both by the amount of current you feed in, as well as the upper state lifetime of the upper state and the, the lower state and the, the band gap, and then also by the photon round trip time for photons bouncing back and forth between the, the two mirrors. And then um, finally we have a high frequency roll off region where because this um, diode is a cavity that only is able to respond to uh, certain frequencies at a certain rate, then if you vary the current very quickly, for example down here at a rate of like 100 gigahertz, it doesn't lead to an equivalent um, variation in the photon number coming out simply because those current variations happen more quickly than the diode is able to, to respond to. Kind of similar to what I explained with the um, video screen before and also the non-ideal measurement setup. So that's all well and good, but I want to highlight that everything I showed in that previous video, it all, always involves variations in the current coming in. And essentially, if you have those variations, you can compute the average number of photons coming out. But when we do a measurement, we don't actually measure the average number of photons, we measure a specific number of photons. And to compute that number of photons, we have to apply another effect, which essentially comes from the quantum nature of light. And I won't go into details with this in this particular video, but the short version of the story is that if you want to have an accurate quantum description of laser light, you have to use a state a little bit like this, where essentially it's a sum over all the possible photon numbers you could measure inside of this, uh, this light field. And it's centered on some average value following a Poisson distribution. So essentially, if you compute the probability of measuring different photon numbers, you'll find that that probability density is centered on some average value, and that has a standard deviation that's equal to the square root of that value. And um, another interesting property here is that if we actually do a measurement, then essentially we're sampling from this um, uh, Poisson distribution, and if the average number of photons in the field is very large, which it typically is for a laser field, then um, essentially you get something that looks like Gaussian noise in the time domain. And then when you compute the Fourier transform that, you get something that just looks like white noise that's sort of flat in the frequency domain. And the upshot of this is that if we apply this Poisson distribution to the um, number calculated by that sort of semi-classical model in the previous video, we get the actual number of photons that we end up measuring using our setup. And the point is that if we compare the um, curve we get from assuming just the average number of photons being present to the curve we get where we also include this um, Poisson distribution noise coming from the quantum nature of light, we see that we get an addition to the overall noise that's just sort of flat. And the point is that for low frequencies, we don't really notice this extra contribution because it's much smaller than the technical noise from the uh, current coming in. But for higher frequencies where the photon number variation would, in theory, roll off and become very small, we can actually notice it here. So basically, the quantum nature of light gives us additional noise for high frequency variations that we otherwise would, would have. Another small detail here is that the level of this uh, noise can be calculated theoretically. And it's actually fairly easy because the noise is basically controlled by this standard deviation here. That's controlled by the average number. And it's fairly easy to figure out that this should be related to both the energy per photon as well as the average number of um, watts of power coming in. And when the factor of two here, that's simply from the fact that we're dealing with the one-sided spectrum to be multiplied by two, as I explained earlier. So um, the upshot of this is that, oh, I should mention, by the way, that of course I've linked to a Python notebook and some papers in the description if you want to look more into the, the background for all of this. But um, the upshot here is that we actually get three different noise regimes that are a bit different from what I explained earlier. We have still the um, low noise regime here, where the sort of flat white noise is caused by, again, electrical current coming in, or rather variations in the electrical current coming in. And then we also have the resonant regime, which still is caused by electrical current variations, uh, just the fact that the laser diode responds more strongly to particular frequencies of current variation. And then finally, we have this uh, new regime here, the uh, additional white noise regime for high frequencies, which actually come from this shot noise that's due to the quantum variations in the photon number. And um, you might sort of uh, suspect that this is a very fundamental amount of noise that you can't really push it any lower. But it turns out you can use something called squeezed states to actually lower this noise floor even further. And I won't go into the exact reason for this here, but the short version of the story is that you can um, graph out a given state of uh, light in a quantum sense on a 2D plane with a distance away from the center, that is the amplitude or the number of photons inside the field, whereas the angle around the center, that is the face of the light. And essentially you can use a set of um, clever experimental tricks to change that um, sort of 2D plot in such a way that 
we get less variation in the amplitude direction at the cost of having more variation in the phase direction. So essentially in this case we are reducing the amount of amplitude noise and the amount of uh, intensity noise at the cost of increasing the phase noise. And of course you can also change this in the other direction if you are more interested in having a very consistent amount of phase compared to having a more steady number of uh, photons. And these kind of tricks are used for a lot of different experiments including I think gravitational wave detection. So I hope you find this video on relative intensity noise interesting. Feel free to check out some of my other videos over here and stay tuned for more. Bye bye.